Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage your moderator for tonight's panel discussion, Jim Scatina. Well, thank you all very much. It's a, it's, it's a great turnout, so we're really impressed. And this is one great looking audience. Let's hear it for you guys. So taking my place on stage is tough when all the chairs are full. So I'll be working from the behind the podium here as we get going. So I hope everyone had a first, a great first day at the show. How did everything work today? Off to a good start? Good. We're really happy to have you here tonight. And we're especially pleased to have such a wonderful group of industry executives and leaders to share information with us tonight. So I'm going to go through the introductions for you. And we scramble, scramble them up on stage so you can stand or raise your hand as I introduce you. First is Lynn Lilly. Lynn. Lynn is the founder of Craft Box Girls and CraftBoxGirls.com, as well as CBG TV on Apple TV. Craft Box Girls is a creative lifestyle destination to discover do it yourself projects, simple recipes, party inspiration, and innovative crafts. Lynn can be seen on Michael Storr's Facebook page, as well as live broadcast host on her weekly 30-minute Facebook live show, Life with, Liv with Lynn Lilly. And on Craftbox Girls Facebook page and on NBC's Atlanta & Company Weekly as the show's DIY expert. Lynn also has appeared in over 300 segments on shows like Good Morning Texas, PBS Make It Artsy, Good Day Chicago, and Talk Philly. Lynn continues to grow her company as she partners with national broadcast networks and companies such as Southern Living, FabFitFun, Brother International, and Teva. Lynn is author of the book, Screen Free Craft Kids Will Love. Let me do that again. Screen Free Crafts Kids Will Love. Um, and while she's not crafting, Lynn spends her time decorating her home, working on new skills like watercolor painting and textile design. She lives in Atlanta with her husband, Brennan, and their newest addition, Baby Lily. Welcome, Lynn. Our next panelist is from my home state of Michigan, Bobby Medema. Bobby. Bobby is the CEO of Notions Marketing. Notions is a global wholesale distributor for the creative arts community. As a third generation leader in her family's business, Bobby has been a part of the craft industry, and I'm sure this is a typo, for over 30 years. Bobby received an MBA from the University of Michigan, or as we say, Go Blue, and lives in Grand Rapids, Michigan with her husband and three boys, Bobby Medema. Next up is Mike McCooey, who I can say plenty about, but they won't let me. <laughs> Mike has been president and CEO of Plaid, for over 24 years. In that time, he has served as chairman of the board for both ACCI. Now, by a show of hands, who remembers ACCI? That's impressive. ACCI and CHA. In addition, since Mike left the board, he's been very active in industry committee work, including compensation and nominating committees. Prior to joining Plaid, Mike held several senior positions in the decorative products field including paint, wall coverings, and fabrics. And I have to editorialize a little because I've had the pleasure of serving on various committees and the various trade associations, HIA, ACCI, and CHA with Mike. Mike was one of the people instrumental in her helping merge the industry associations a number of years back when ACCI and HIA became CHA. This is a guy who's given a lot of his time to the industry, Mike McCooley. Next up, our neighbor from up north, Ryan Newell. Ryan is the president. Ryan is the president and CEO of Spinrite Yarns. He's a consumer product business executive with over 18 years of general management and finance experience. Under Ryan's leadership, Spinrite has grown to be the largest craft yarn company in North America. That's a pretty big accomplishment with over 500 employees. Spinrite is well known for Bernat, Karen, 
and Lily Sugar and Cream brands, as well as its online inspiration hub, Yarnspirations.com. Ryan New. I'm worried about the cheerleading section for this one, but Stacy Park. Somehow I knew. In case you can't tell by the shirts, Stacy is the owner of Scrapbooking Made Simple. Stacy Park is a wife, a mom, and the owner of Scrapbooking Made Simple for over 17 years. Scrapbooking Made Simple is a traditional mom and pop brick and mortar store with a very strong online presence. In addition, Stacy manufactures, her company manufactures her own dyes, stamps, consumables, tools, all under the brands of Simply Defined and Simply Refined. Scrapbooking Made Simple is proud to have over 235,000 fans on Facebook, 70,000 subscribers on YouTube, and almost 13,000 Instagram followers. Stacy's been married to her husband Michael for 23 years and has two boys, Michael Jr. and James, ages 16 and 17. According to Stacy, life is busy but always creative. Stacy Park. <laughs> Anthony Paperno. <laughs> Anthony is the current president of the National Arts and, and uh, actually president and chief marketing and merchandising officer, right? It's a big title. Yeah. Do your shoulders hurt from carrying that one? Okay. He's the CMMO and the president of the National Arts and Crafts retailer AC Moore. AC Moore operates 145 stores across the United States, including a recent opening in Montana. What was the one out west? Oh, Idaho. Idaho. Yeah, a lot of room in between. You might have noticed. 145 stores across the U.S., including global head and their global headquarters in New Jersey and offices in China. Since 2011, Anthony has led AC Moore's marketing and merchandising teams. He oversees product development, global sourcing, and store operations. At the beginning of 2018, Anthony was appointed president of AC Moore, the youngest person to be named to the position since the company's in inception. Anthony Paperno. And last and most important, that's right, the right way to say it, isn't it? Uh, Jennifer Vandervelt. Jennifer is the Vice President of Strategy and Analytics for the Michaels Companies. As Vice President of Strategy and Analytics, Jennifer is responsible for evaluating corporate growth opportunities at Michaels. Jennifer is also leading Michaels' efforts to leverage the robust amount of data that they have to deliver even more personalized communications, experiences, and products to their customers. Jennifer has previously held executive positions at other retailers and was formerly an investment banker overseeing mergers and acquisitions and capital market activity for retail sector clients. Ladies and gentlemen, Jennifer Vandervelt. Uh, I'd like to take a, really a moment to thank them now for giving us this opportunity. And it's a rare opportunity for all of us to get some insight from these um, very experienced and very successful industry executives. So I'm going to start out with a number of questions for them. And I think we're just going to rotate through the chairs to hear their responses. Um, if time permits, we'll have some open questions that I've brought along with me. So let's see how things go from there. I'd say first question, and I'm going to start with Lynn. As an industry, as a craft industry, what do you believe are our major challenges? So I think we have a few, but I think one that probably most of you can agree upon is how do we market based on the difference in generations, right? Um, learning how to deal with a new generation that's tech savvy and how do we stay and build connections with those as well as keep and strengthen our connections with the older consumer. Um, I think that's a big pain point that I've talked to people year after year at the show is how do we bridge that gap and continue to build relationships and build marketing strategies to reach both of those demographics. 
Anthony, you want to take that one? Absolutely. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think that the fight for the customer and the uniqueness of marketing is progressing makes it so difficult. You know, I remember the days where you just had to put a hot ad in the newspaper and people came to you. And now the customer acquisition costs and being relevant to the customer on the array of different demographics to drive trip motivation, whether physical to digital, I find one of the biggest obstacles is we're all fighting for that consumer. Um, and I don't see it getting any easier as time moves forward. Can you just expand on that customer relevancy for one second? Yeah, I think that, you know, content's king, I always say. Um, and, you, and there's so many different ways to ingest content with media now between social media and everything else that you can do. And it's very hard to be relevant at store level. So someone that's doing obviously different crafts inside the building, how do you make that content relevant to them to own ownership or frequency or loyalty? I think that's one of our largest challenges right now. Great. Mike. Well, from a manufacturing standpoint, I think we've got a couple big kind of macro issues going on. Number one is tariffs. And I think that there's a short-term problem with tariffs and a long-term problem with tariffs. They, in the short term, it's an economic problem for our manufacturers and ultimately the consumer who's going to get higher prices for a very discretionary product and a very frugal customer base that we have. I think longer term, it's going to cause people to rethink supply chains. I think people are starting to realize that the nature of doing business, particularly in China, with the political and social uh, restrictions that are going on in that country, um, is going to have long-term implications to supply chain. So, I'll give you an example. We have a supplier who within two months, two suppliers, within two months of the announcement of the tariffs, moved to Vietnam, started business seamlessly. Mm. Okay? There's going to be a lot of that, and I think putting all our eggs in one basket is starting to come home to roost. And the other one related is over-regulation. The cost of regulation compliance is off the charts. It starts with Prop 65 in California, and goes across the country like a disease. And it is costing us a fortune as a manufacturing group. Mike, uh, in, in terms of regulation, do, does every state have the right to have a separate and distinct regulation on, on the same product? I think they do, but the problem is it becomes national, be, by de facto national, because we can't say to our customers, do not sell this in the state of California or the uh -huh. state of Washington or the state of Illinois. So therefore, state law becomes national law. So the lowest common denominator. So, so issues like Proposition 65 ultimately spread across the country. Wow. Ryan, you want to give this one a toss? Sure. I, I think um, if we look back at 2018, uh, the one thing that we couldn't control is the economy. And uh, I think that the economy actually was too good for our industry. And I know that sounds odd. Um, I always tell my friends that in the yarn business, there's two things that we wish for. It's cold enough for people to stay inside and want to do nothing but knit or crochet. <laughs> and, and two, for them to be a little bit uneasy about the economy. Because if they're a little bit uneasy about the economy, they're not going out and booking trips and buying cars. And they're, they're looking at hobbies that mean, uh, mean the most to them that don't cost a whole lot of money. Um, and I think last year, consumer confidence was, was high enough that it hurt us as an industry. When we start hearing that Black Friday went, was very good, that's not great for us. So um, I think if the last few weeks is an indication of what 2019 will be like, I think it'll be a better year. Um, the better year for us. <laughs> so, for who, Ryan? Maybe, maybe not for everybody, but for us, yes. Uh, for our industry. Um, and I think that the, the second issue that we have, um, and, and this is going to sound a little bit odd too, but I actually think we make it too difficult for our retailers um, as a vendor base. That um, when you look across, not only on this show floor, but um, if you pick up a Notions catalog, there are literally thousands of vendors. So if I'm Anthony um, and, and I'm, you know, in charge of all merchandising, um, and I've got all these people that, that my buyers need to meet with, it's very inefficient. They can't focus on, on, uh, on the number of vendors that I think they should. So I think our industry presents a challenge. We are just so fragmented uh, compared to a lot of other industries. Uh, just keep in the back of your mind, I, I want to dig into tariffs 
if we have time a little later in the conversation. So if, you, if you've got some thoughts on tariffs, or if you'd like to comment on anything that any of the other panel participants have stated, feel free to raise a hand and let me know. Jennifer. All right. Um, you remember the question I, still? I do. <laughs> Is this on? Okay, yes. I was, I was told to hold it as a, an ice cream cone, so you can hear me clearly. <laughs> um, I agree with Anthony. I agree with Mike. I agree with everyone on the panel. From a retail perspective, though, I think we look at things like channel shift and digital disruption as both opportunities, great opportunities, but also they present big challenges. Um, you know, we, our mission is make creativity happen. I think increasingly we believe we also need to make convenience happen. It's table stakes. How do we make it easy to do and conduct that transaction? And so we're leaning into things that make that convenience play really, really easy for the customer. I think there's also a, a relevance issue. Uh, when you talk about how fragmented, going back to what Ryan just said, the, uh, the assortment is within our, our, our box uh, online, um, I think we need to know what she's looking for, when she's looking for it, and you know, it's not necessarily one-to-one -one personalization, but it certainly is, I need to know you much better than I do to make sure that I'm presenting the right content, not necessarily increasingly in our circular. We continue to cut back on that and push into digital spaces, but the cost of, of acquisition in those um, digital markets ends up becoming a challenge in and of itself. And so there's a, an algorithm that we're looking to find um, that really enables us to connect with her in the way that she needs to be connected with to make that transaction as easy as possible. And those things today are becoming table stakes. Great. Uh, Bobby, greatest challenge. Okay, so agree with Mike on tariffs and, um, and it, it, just because of the cost impact that could be coming at us as an industry this year. Um, and adding to that, that you know, the big shift that we see is the way people buy. I mean, it really is shifting. Convenience is very much, uh, it's, it's much, much more important. And uh, our vet, we see our vendor community and our retail community both large and small, really struggling with how to allocate their time, treasure, and talent towards you know, the, the best way to capture um, the retail, the consumer's attention. Um, it's, it's complicated, and it's a, a new skill set, and that can be daunting and challenging to approach, and um, there's, you know, it just, it, it, everyone needs, there's a, uh, there's a challenge in acclimating to that, right? Um, so, you know, maybe the challenge is the ability to change, the ability to try new things and let new thing, let those things go and the ability to fail fast and keep moving and stay nimble. Fail fast. Jennifer, how many employees does Michaels have? Oh gosh, uh, in our corporate location, 2,000, broadly, you know, more than 25,000, I mean, lots of employees and team members, and that really pluses up during peak holiday season, which we just went through. Bobby, how many employees does Notions Marketing have? We're around 800. Ryan, we know you're around 500. Mike? About 400. Stacy, this is why I'm so happy to have you on the panel. Hi. <laughs> how many employees do you have, Stacy? Um, so we have approximately 19 employees with my husband and I, that would make it 21. We have employees who are delegated strictly to our retail store, and then we have employees who work upstairs in order fulfillment. We do cross-train all the way so that if we need to pull resources, we're able to allocate efficiently. So this is why I was so happy that you agreed to be on the panel, because in many ways on all of these questions, you're a lot closer to the fire. I am a lot closer to the fire. I'm right in the middle of the fire. So as someone who <laughs> rings the cash register, yes, unloads the truck, yes. deals with the employees who don't yes. show up, yes. what do you think the industry's biggest challenges are? I guess for me it's a little hard to speak to the entire industry because I am a retail-based business. So it's easier for me to talk to those of you who are also a retail-based business, specifically a small mom and pop, because ultimately that's what Scrapbooking Made Simple is. I don't have an IT department. I don't have a management department. I don't have human resources. We do it all. We wear all those hats. And um, 
And so I think that most independent retailers are also in the same predicament I am. We work seven days a week sometimes, and we're there to meet the customer. So for me, what the industry challenges are is more towards what the independents need. And I think for me, what I would say to an independent is figure out who you are. You cannot be everything to everybody. You need to decide what it is you want to bring forth in your store and then do it the best you possibly can with so much product coming to the market so quickly. So many people think that, oh, if I don't carry this or if I don't have that, then I'm going to lose customers. But when your store is fragmented and they don't know what you stand for, they don't know what your niche is, they don't know what it is you want to be, if you're going to sell paper, sell it the best. Sell it better than anybody else. Make sure that, the, that you've got every paper so when they come, they're not going to buy two sheets of 79 cent paper. They're going to leave with 50 sheets of 79 cent paper. Figure out who you are, who you want your store to be. You believed in yourself enough to take the leap and open those doors. Now figure out who it is those doors are going to, when your customers walk through. Be concise in what you carry. Be specific in what you carry. And then be the best at it. And you will see that no matter what the, the Amazon of the worlds are doing or you, whatever internet is the, 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 the new hot spot to buy your product, nothing will ever take the place of you knowing your customer's name when they walk in. And if they buy it from Amazon, or they go to Michael's and they use their 40% off coupon. <laughs> Even I can laugh at that. <laughs> it's okay. Stacey, you promised me. I know. Well, should I? You promised me you were going to behave. I, uh, let them use their 40% off coupon at Michael's. And then when they don't know how to use it. <laughs> show that customer <laughs> why they should shop with you. <laughs> Anthony, you have a comment. <clears throat> yeah. <I> <laughs> Please. I have 40 off coupons, too. You're and not in my territory. Okay, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> I'll stick to my knitting. You know, you know there's a BOGO deal this weekend. <laughs> uh, I think Ryan brings a, a very interesting perception um, here coming as a manufacturer, saying how do we have to make it easier for buyers. Um, and that, that's really refreshing, Ryan. You know, if you look at this room, everyone's either a manufacturer or a buyer. And our challenge is, I think of some of my buyers are here, you have a finite amount of space, and you go to the show, and I can see that yeah, they're so overwhelmed. You know, like I was in the tonic booth today, and they try to show me a thousand items. I'm like, give me five items. Give me five A plus items I can actually implement tomorrow. And as I say that, the biggest challenge and my fear for the industry is that's going to suppress innovation. You know what I mean? And I think it piggybacks on what you're saying is that be true to your knitting and be the best in your category. You know, I think that selfishly for myself, you know, we're here to look for new products and if we only have so much amount of space. I'm afraid that suppress innovation and entrepreneurship, which I think that this is the foundation of this industry. And I think it's something that needs to be addressed moving forward. Can I say something to that? As long as you don't tease Michaels. Uh, well, I, no, not Michaels. Now I'm going to tease AC Moore. <laughs> So he's at Tonic, and he wants to find five products. That's what you've got space for. That's what you've got in your category, open to buy, whatever. I was just really overwhelmed by being in the booth, to be honest with you. <laughs> so whatever, if you're an independent retailer, whatever five products he buys, go buy them. Don't be afraid of the box stores. Embrace the box stores. Find out what they can't do as well as you. And distribution, distribution is one of them. So when he brings in four of the new tonic whatever, and it sells out, and they can't get it back in their stores for two weeks, three weeks, a month, you have it in your store. 
Because eventually, that 40% off coupon or whatever they're using isn't worth the time to drive there to find they don't have it in stock. They just as soon come to you, pay you for it, and leave that day having it in their hands. So buy what they are buying. Embrace the box stores. Go introduce yourself to the managers of the box stores because when they're out of it, you want them to say, oh, there's another scrapbooking store down the street. I'm sure Stacy's got it. Amen. So believe it or not, we started that question off with what are major challenges. I think we got, we got there, eventually. But now I'd like to go back and, and take the other side of that question and talk about what are the major opportunities in the industry. And this time, I'm going to start with Mike and then just let you guys go down the road that way. And, and maybe Stacy could be last. <laughs> Well, I think uh, Anthony touched on it, and it's, uh, number one is innovation and uh, creativity. And as I come to these shows and I go into buyers' offices, it's, it's the number one lament I hear from everybody. And you know, there's a lot of reasons for it. A lot of people blame it on the demise of the independent retailer, lack of uh, investment by uh, manufacturers, and so on and so forth. But uh, I think that any business that doesn't devote themselves to uh, innovating new product Put letting their, their creative juices loose is going to lose. The second part of that, I think, is it's not good enough just to give them the creative product. I think education is the second leg of that uh, program. If you don't teach them what to do with it, if you don't show them that they're going to have a beautiful product, product at the end, if you don't convince them that indeed they can do it, it's not that hard with a little instruction. And I think uh, YouTube and the whole social media and Lynn and people like her are doing a tremendous service to this industry where different parts of the industry have fallen off in this area. And I think it's up to manufacturers as well to commit to it. And uh, we have in our company, and we're going to continue to. So opportunities. Gonna, opportunities. That's what we're talking about. So I'll piggyback on innovation. I was actually a judge for the um, new product innovation. And I will say I was a little bit disappointed. Some of those products had been out and weren't exactly new. So I think as an industry, we do really need to focus on innovation. Um, you know, there's opportunity out there, I think, for the industry to not get stale. Um, so I think that that's something that you guys, as you look at 2019, 2020, digging deep into innovation, I think is huge. Secondly, I would say connecting to your consumer. There's more opportunities than ever right now to build that relationship and understand who your consumer is. Social media is a great avenue to do that. You don't have to work with an influencer to do that. You can do that by opening up your Facebook page or your YouTube account. Build that connection. I work with Michaels as the Michaels Maker. We started a program in January where I was promoting their Make Break events that happen on Saturdays on their Facebook page. Every Wednesday at 1 p.m., I go live and share what that Make Break event is. And we realized when I skipped a week, People were messaging the page, saying, where is she? They know about my child. They knew about my child's birthday. But so we were able to build that connection and start to understand more about our consumer. And I'd be talking to them during the live and saying, you know, what do you like about this? What are you guys buying right now at Michael's? What are you doing? So gathering information like that and learning about your consumers is going to help you better understand them, buy the right products for them, right? And they want to know you and know that you care about them. And social media is the perfect opportunity for that. And I don't think that everyone's hitting on that in the industry. Great. Lobby opportunities. There's a drum roll. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So the perennial uh, answer to that question in this industry seems to be innovation, inspiration, and education, right? I mean, we've all been um, listening to that, and, and that, is the, that is the answer, right? But um, what I think is so interesting about what's happening now is data analytics are adding a new tier to the tool set that everybody has available, and it is so much more accessible. Um, it is something that we are seeing come through in the reporting that comes to us from our vendor community. It's something that we know is happening at the large chain, uh, large retailer level, but it is something that we, we see is so very accessible to any retailer. Um, there's great open source tools to be able to really understand what your customer is buying and to segment that and to see what is working. It's an opportunity to look at what's working in a really, really objective way 
which is an important thing for our industry because you know a lot of us are buying because we love to be here and because we love the product and you know there's you know something that we hear sometimes from our manufacturers is you know sometimes the retailers are a little bit too married to their product right and so you know data analytics allows that ob objectivity and really creates nice windows to really understand what is working and um, to, to move in that direction, to test in that direction, and to just try new things in a very, in, in just in, in an, an objective way. So um, we're really enthused about what, what is available with, um, with, through data and see a lot of opportunity there. Um, not, not to sound repetitive, but for <laughs> sure, uh, innovation and product development. Um, if you think of, of what slime and that whole slime craze did to our industry. I mean, we rely so heavily on that hot product. And sure, I'd love it to be one of our yarns, but if it's, if it's slime selling glue, as long as it brings foot traffic into the store, then I have a much better chance of selling more of my product. Um, so, you know, and, and, and we've gone through years where we haven't had that hot product and we've suffered as an industry. So the creativity, absolutely. Margins, uh, top line sales are very important, but that creativity, if it's not there, we're not going to win. Um, secondly, I would say for sure um, that we need to each find our digital strategy. Um, talk to a lot of people and ask them what their digital strategy is, and so they'll, they, they'll say, oh yeah, I sell on Amazon. That's not a digital strategy, uh, especially in our industry, because I mean, e-commerce is, is great for a lot of companies. I actually don't think craft companies do that well with e-commerce. People still love to touch, feel the product. They love the adventure of going to the store, whether it's an independent store, AC Moore or Michaels. They just love that adventure. Um, so I don't, and I don't see that changing. E-commerce sales will continue to inch up. People looking for convenience, but it's not gonna radically change our industry. Um, so finding that digital strategy doesn't mean just finding a way to sell online, it's finding the, the best way to inspire consumers. Uh, whether you're a big company or a small company, that digital strategy could change significantly. Whether it's social media, and the, which is very easy. I see some of the, the Instagram uh, posts that I see are fantastic, and they're from individuals or small companies. And they outpace, you know, things that we do or other bigger companies can do. So finding a way to inspire your consumer and bring them into the store, um, they're probably going to convert in store as opposed to being online. So finding the right digital strategy for each of us, I think, is, is a major opportunity for our industry. I'm going to sound like a broken record, but everything that has been said, I think that we really agree with. Uh, innovation is key. Data is key. Data in service of driving a digital strategy so that you can connect with your customer to help solution is so important. Um, and so, you know, all of those things, I think, have to come together. I came most recently, not been at Michael's that long, I'm relatively new to arts and crafts, um, but I, I, my, I was last at Petco, and that retailer is, from a, from a product standpoint, is dealing with totally different types of things in the sense that the food, once you understand the food, someone stays with the food for their animal for years. And it's a repetitive, replenishable purchase. Those sorts of things are very easy to service if you're prime sticky, you know, if you've got an account online, you don't necessarily need to go into the box to get it. I think as you've just heard a lot of other folks remarking upon, that's not this space. There's so many different interesting projects and needs and the yarner looks so much different than the painter and what they're interested in. And, and we're looking at data all the time on our customers and, and how customers behave, where their affinities are, how you kind of spread those affinities and connect them to not only the product, but the solutions or the inspiration behind that. And so I think there's always going to be a role for the four walls to play in this equation. Um, I think it becomes more important and incumbent for us to demonstrate to her how to make it more easily, especially for those that maybe see crafting as a bit of a barrier. I'm, I'm not the craftiest person, but since going to Michael's and 
getting my 30% void. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I did find when I bought my cricket that um, that didn't apply. <laughs> You know that, that some of those some of those opportunities to understand is, is someone who wants to create wants the screen free time with the children. Um, we have two young children. You almost need that person to kind of help you through it. And whether that's the independent store owner that shows you a new way to make slime that you didn't think of before, or whether that's hopefully one of our Michaels partners that is taking the wonderful product and introducing it to her, especially the her that feels like she's not a master crafter in a new way. I think that interaction is so important, and we need to continue to foster that, whether that's a person-to-person -person interaction or whether that's some sort of digital interaction that, that we help facilitate the sale of product through. Do you want Anthony. to skip me? <laughs> yeah, I echo everything that everyone said. You know, um, definitely the data. You have to be pouring more into that. The shift into the digital spending, pulling back on print. But I think it's the the challenge and the large opportunity to connect with the customers, having a personal connection conversation with them, the way they want. So some of them want a coupon. Some of them want three for ten jar candles, and some of them want a two minute video on hand knitting or on paint pouring and finding out how you can connect on that level with them and have a personal conversation, getting off this batch of glass. So segment, segmenting and driving trip motivation or, or frequency, I think is just very difficult because you send out an email and a fine knit and crochet and in my email blast on one day, nothing about yarn, you're totally irrelevant on that day and time to that consumer. So how do you peel back the onion and layers to be able to speak to them? I think they, they want it, they deserve it, and I think the challenge is for us is to be able to accomplish that. But the opportunity to connect on that level, I think you can drive your brand forward. Well, one thing I would say on that is we've even thought of personalization as, you know, is it personalizing or is it relevance, right? And there's so much digital signal out there today. So, you know, you might have bought something at Michael's four months ago, but if you're on the train on the way to work and you just opened up your app and you looked at a certain category page, that is a really strong signal that we need to start being able to react to. Um, because others, more digital native companies that grew up with huh, all of this, this is something that we're all becoming accustomed to. And so when it comes to product recommendations or other, other sorts of things, I think it's absolutely personalization, but it's, it's also kind of being able to tell when you do things, where you do things, and being able to react to those signals that I know we spend a lot of time at Michael's focused on. Stacy, big opportunity. What's the big opportunity? Okay, so again, from a mom and pop retailer standpoint, um, I think that there's probably two. You've heard social media, and yes, that's very important. If you were to go back and look at my YouTubes, my very first YouTube was learning how to hold a video camera. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I am 50 years old, and I was not born in the social media age. It did not come naturally, and I had to figure it out. But for you independent retailers, you have to start. I don't have a studio and I don't have fancy lighting, and if you watch my YouTubes, I actually turn the camera down when it's not on my face. And you can do this. This is an opportunity for you. You don't have to feel intimidated because you're just being you. You is enough for your customer. And if you are you and they see that, they will respond to that. But if they don't, if you, if you don't ever start how will you ever know? My 16-year-old niece and nephew had to set up my Facebook page. I didn't know how to do it, but we have almost 240,000 fans right now. It did not come easy, and it did not come fast. You have to be committed. Do not feel discouraged. Try. If you don't try, you're going to get nothing. And be consistent. If you only do a Facebook post once a day, then do it once a day. If you're going to do once a week, well, that's not as good as once a day, but at least it's a start. And be yourself. The second thing I think is an opportunity is after you figured out what you want your store to be, are you going to focus on tools and techniques and dyes and stamps, or are you mixed media? What are you? 
When you figure that out, pick your manufacturers strategically. Be a strategic partner to these manufacturers. Become important to them. You can't be important to everybody. So pick who you want to be important to and then leverage that. Use them. <laughs> Become somebody that they want their product in your store. So when you need a little favor or you want a little exclusive or you need samples made for your retail store because you don't have the staff to sit there and do that, but you've become important to them, ask them. The worst they're going to say is no. And then you're going to look at them like, really? You've got a whole art department. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to be strategic in who you partner with. And then be loyal. Because if you're loyal to those manufacturers, you will find that they will be loyal to you. So those are your opportunities. Figure out who you are, partner well. And don't be afraid to put yourself out there, even if it's one post a week. Go back, watch my first YouTube. It literally is me holding a camera saying, I don't know how to do this. And in YouTube, I was only allowed to do 15-minute YouTubes when I started. Now I can do up to 12 hours if I wanted. And my YouTubes are, every Saturday, they are completely unedited, one take all the way through, and they average an hour and a half long. They are a class. So try, because if you don't, if you don't start today, it's not going to get any better tomorrow for you. That's awesome. Um, we're going to do a little role reversal. And a little audience participation. So I'll, I'll shout outs on this one. But in your store, in your industry, in your community, what's hot right now? What's the trend? What's the product? Anybody? Shy? Pay for it. Pay for it, everybody? Interesting. <coughs> Okay. Alcohol ink. Which one? Alcohol ink. Oh, okay. Alcohol ink. spent so much time focusing on accommodating our growth and we've treated some of our people almost like they were part of the manufacturing cycle so you know we've got to produce more patterns we've got to put out more new products and by doing so we we've, we've gotten away from allowing them to have the creative time that they need to actually do their job so um, you know we've, we've I, I hate to use the term, but we've almost treated them more like robots, and it, it wasn't obviously intentional, but um, we just haven't given them enough creative time. And I, I'm guessing that that's the case for a lot of companies that, whether you're a manufacturer or a retailer or, or, uh, or, or, or a distributor, it doesn't matter. It's if, if, we, if we're in a creative industry, if we don't give our teams the creative time to, to excel, then we're not going to win. So I, I think that's probably been the biggest challenge at, at Spinnerin. Well, for us, I think it's, it's a little bit of that. We've been incredibly busy over the past five years doing what we do. We are still a very creative company. I think if I, I don't think we're limited except by our manufacturing flexibility. You really, you know, you do something, you, you make paint, you fill paint. Um, we have, you know, 1,200 different formulas. We have probably, I don't know, three or four dozen different put-ups of containers, and there's always new and different stuff that our product development people come up with, and it takes capital investment, it takes time, 
It takes experimentation. You come up with a new formula. You have to give it shelf time to make sure it's stable over time, so you don't put a, a you know bad product in the market. So that's kind of the limiting factor for us. We got the people. We got the ideas. We got the brains. Um, it's it's the operation side of it where we're kind of dropping the ball. Jim, can I add something to that? You may go. So, you know, the conversation is about innovation and kind of alludes to the fact that maybe there's not as much innovation as the industry would like. And I just would like to comment that, um, you know, we are, we add a lot of product, as a lot of you probably know, but we are seeing approximately 4,000 new items come out of this industry every single month. So the idea that it, it, there's an incredible amount of new that is coming from the manufacturing community. And, you know, so the opportunity and the challenge really is distilling that and finding the things that are really unique and interesting. And, you know, we know, we know, we see it. There's a lot of great product that doesn't get as much time and attention as it could, right? right. And, you know, if you ask Ryan or I, you know, what are the best most innovative products happening um, in the spin line, spin right line right now that are working. He has an answer to that, and I have an answer to that, right? So same thing with Plaid. The manufacturers and the distributors know what's working, and there's a lot of new product in this industry. Probably more new product than any industry that any of us could. I mean, Pets is pretty robust, but four thousand items a month. And we don't see, we haven't seen it slow. How many products do you stock? Um, what do you think, Chris? One, one seven, 170,000? Yeah. That's a lot of product. Can I, can I tap into that? Yes, ma'am. So, innovation is important, absolutely. But what good is innovation if you can't afford to buy it? <laughs> you can come out with the best product since sliced bread, but if you have no open to buy in your budget, then it doesn't matter. So you mean the retailer? I mean the retailer. Yeah, I mean, from, from the retail standpoint, 4,000 products a month coming into Notions. There's not, there's not, as far as I know, a small independent retail store anywhere that could afford to bring in or have the space for 4,000 products a month. And when it's coming so fast and so fluid, you're right, products get left behind, and that's where that's where my YouTubes come in because, because there are some amazing products out there. But then we also are dealing with the manufacturers who are selling direct to the consumer themselves, which is a huge issue as well because not only is the independent fighting the Amazons of the world, well, we shouldn't fight them. We, we're going to have to embrace the Amazons, and we're going to embrace the box stores, but now we're competing with our own manufacturers. And, and we have to find a way to come past that. And, and so, even though innovation is really important, I think also for an independent retailer to be able to bring in those products that you want every month when Notions is bringing them out, you need to suck it up, Buttercup, and you need to go through your, your inventory and you need to be ready to just let it go. Be honest with yourself. Is this product selling? You may love it. It may just touch your heart. But if it's still on your shelf, after a specific amount of time, rip the Band-Aid off and let it go. It's only costing you more money because you're losing sales off of the product that has been innovative and brought into notions. So take that opportunity to be real with yourself because that's what this topic is. And accept that not everything is going to be a home run. Not everything you love, everybody else is going to love. And give your store the opportunity to turn through and find what your customers do love so you don't make any money off of something. That's okay. Like you, somebody said earlier, accept your failure, move on, be done. It's not a failure, it's a learning experience. And go. I feel like paying well to the competition if it's any, any consolation. The nature of competition has changed at every level. Uh, I used to just have a competitor. If I make pain, I had a pain competitor. Now, my suppliers are my competitors. My customers are my competitors. I was in a factory, a wood factory several years ago, in God's country in China, 
my, probably my dad's country, but I was a child, <laughs> way up north, and I'm walking out on the shipping dock, and I see a pallet of wood for AC Moore, one for Michaels, one for Joann's, one for Hobby Lobby, one for Plaid, across the whole shipping dock. I mean, that's tough. And they are savvy enough now to go directly to the big box guys, even if the big box guys, they used to be afraid of them. They say, you sell Michaels for me. I would never talk to Michaels. I'm afraid of them. They're not afraid anywhere. We've made them sophisticated enough to deal with them. So it's a whole supply chain that's, that's get a whole different level of competition. And we're fighting it every day. And the answer is for us to outcreate the other guys, to differentiate ourselves, and be faster than those guys. And the answer for us is to know your customer's name when they walk in your store. Know your customer. Know them by name. And they won't leave you. They'll stick with you. So I'm going to so, correct this Jim, Jim, sorry, just maybe one more right. comment. Um, and, and, and obviously I'm not in paper crafting, but uh, I do sell online as a manufacturer. Um, but just to clarify, the reason that we sell online, our best selling items online, are not our best products. They're the shades of our yarns that people can't get in store. So we have, a, we have a yarn that, if it has 100 shades, we're lucky to place 60 at the best, at best in any one retailer. If the consumer wants other shades to supplement what she's bought in store, she'll come to our site. And she'll pay full SRP on our site. Um, so I would characterize you know, our site as a pretty bad competitor, but it is a place where she can go and find whatever she needs. Um, so if I can only get seven items or seven SKUs uh, in a row at, at Michael's or AC Moore, then she knows that she can go and supplement that with, uh, with online. So I just want to clarify, it's, it's not that you know, we, we use that as a way to, to please our customers because we get constant communication from them saying, hey, why can't I find this cherry red? in Michaels or AC Moore or an independent store. How come I can't find that anywhere? Now she has a solution coming direct to our, our site. So it, it's not that we're, we're looking to be competitors. I agree with Mike that the landscape has totally changed um, and that you're competing with people that you've never had to worry about before. Um, but that's you know the main reason that we sell online. And we're the same. We, we call it a default sale. If our, we sell full bus stop retail, uh, for customers who can't find it in the store, or maybe the retailers don't stock it, or maybe the person is homebound and can't get to a store, and it is a small fraction, less than 2% of our sales, and we don't want it any more than that. Yes. <laughs> but then there's also the manufacturers, and mind you, you retail stores, independent stores, understand, the manufacturers didn't go straight to consumer because they wanted to. They went straight to consumer because they had to. As the market has shrunk, they didn't have any other opportunity. If you want their product in your store, they have to stay in business. They can't stay in business with the amount of independent retailers that are left. So they had to go to consumer. It's not that they wanted to, they had to. At the same time, when a product drops from a manufacturer and lands in my store the same day, and they already have it on their website. They didn't give me an opportunity to sell through that product. Not a product that maybe 60 shades aren't available in an independent retailer, but item for item drops the same day. What does that say to me? How am I going to move that through? You're making better margin on it. You manufactured it. <laughs> so you're making more money than I am. Yet, I'm the one doing the education for your consumer. I don't know. It's a slippery slope there. So I, I, I do understand. And I want the independent retailer to know it wasn't that manufacturers wanted to sidestep you. It's that for them to stay in business, they needed to do this. However, I think that there is a more responsible way to do this than dropping product relatively at the exact same time before I even get the opportunity to sell through. I'll tie it up in a bow, is that all right? Perfect. Very beautiful. Um, I think the beauty about this industry and the relationships, like I think what Mike and Ryan are saying, is spot on. 
<clears throat> we can peep, but we're partners, and I think all boats rise with the tide. So, for instance, I look at Mike and Ryan as extreme strategic vendor partners for AC Moore. I import paint, I import yarn. They sell direct to the consumer, um, and there's no bad blood. And I think that's the beauty about this, is that we're both trying to do the same thing and survive, but at the end of the day, uh, we still partner to drive forward. And I think that's what makes the industry, you know, even though the tide's changing, it makes it more aggressive and competitive, we can still stand up here, have dinner, shake hands, and still partner together to drive the business forward. I think it's important for anyone to understand that. That's a very good point. And, and it's one of the beautiful, beautiful parts of our industry. There is a lot of cooperation between retailers and suppliers, manufacturers, distributors. Um, we're unique in that way. Um, I'm going to turn it to Lynn for a second. We've talked a lot about new consumers, and the, the longest term new p potential consumers are children. You probably spend um, a reasonable amount of time focusing on younger consumers. How have you been successful with that when they've got so much digital distraction? Well, I think there, it's twofold, right? So you always have to be thinking about the next generation. So whether that's the millennial, that's the older millennials that are now having children, like myself. Um, so I think it's looking at what that landscape is and how they are getting and consuming content. So looking at it from a retailer perspective, um, you know, people have slowed down on searching for specific products, right? Moms and dads are now searching for inspiration of what to do with their kids, right? So they're discovering products through inspiration. So I think that's where people like me and the other influencers that are in this room have become partners with manufacturers and with retailers like Michaels and AC Moore is looking at how we can be the outlet to reach that next generation. So mom is watching my Facebook Live, right, and is discovering a kid's craft that I'm doing and, oh, wait, what's that product that you're using? She's instantly able to ask me where she can get that product, right, because I can talk to my consumer. So I think it's really important to think about where consumers are finding out about products and how they're doing it. So how is mom researching what to do with kids? How is mom getting those ideas? So I think staying on the forefront of that is really, really important. Good. Anyone else on the, on the children issue? Any thoughts? Um, it's funny, when, when uh, my first meeting ever, uh, when I took over at Spinrite, I was in front of a retailer and he sat down and said, um, I have one question for you. And remember, like, I am brand new. He's like, what are you doing to regenerate your consumer base? Because in case you didn't notice, your consumer is dying. <laughs> what, a, what a way to start off a meeting. <laughs> um, so so we, we, we don't do a... I mean, I, we, we focus on it a lot, but knitting and crocheting, it's, 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 a, it's difficult. Right. Um, we had great success this year, and, and uh, some of my competitors did as well, um, by coming out with a product that tore down the barriers of learning to use uh, knitting needles and a crochet hook. Um, so you can, you can now you know, put together a blanket with just your hands. You can learn in three minutes and have a project done in a couple hours. Instant gratification for kids. They love it. I watch my kids do it. They never wanted to, to learn how to knit or crochet until we came up with that product. So I think the key to get to kids, it's, it's one thing to say, okay, make it cool. Okay, I'm, I'm 44 years old. My kids don't think I'm cool anymore. <laughs> and, but but when, you, when you tear down the barriers to different crafts um, and make it that the project is, is, is very gratifying, you know, I think that's the key to success. That's certainly what we found this year. And you think that's an opportunity? I, I think in in in, the speaking, in in within yarn, absolutely. Um, I I, sir, I think uh, paper crafting they do a lot better job. Um, but uh, I, I I I I've got to believe there's other opportunities like we discovered in yarn. I'll step in on that really quick. Also thinking outside the box on how your product can be used untraditionally. I think it's really big right now with the younger generation. So you're so used to thinking about how your product is used traditionally, right? If you can think of other ways in which you could use yarn, so maybe it's not knitting, maybe it's not crochet, maybe it's making home decor, like using HGTV magazine. So what are those other ways that you can use your product that's outside of the norm? 
I think it'd be really helpful with the younger generations. I have a kind of a selfish question on this one. I'm going to take advantage of Anthony's, half of Anthony's title was Chief Marketing and Merchandising Officer. So we're virtually at the epicenter of the craft industry here. We have everything from retailers, wholesalers, influencers, educators, mom and pops, chain stores, like we're the epicenter of the industry right now. Let me put you on the spot and ask you, what are the most exciting opportunities you saw? I know you've only, I mean, the show's only been open one day. Oh, today? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, th it, I mean, I guess it's one of my 15th years as a show. I've been here as a <clears throat> manufacturer and distributor. I've been here as an independent, ran six stores, and now we run AC Moore, which is uh, much larger. And I guess the, the one common thread outside, I like this product and not this one, is I'm continued inspired when we go into booths. And I think it's so frustrating and difficult for me to leverage that. And I mean, like, for instance, I'm in Ryan's booth today, and I see all this yarn, and I see it all knitted up in scarves and samples, and that's what drives the customer. And sometimes when we look at our store, we walk our store as an executive team all the time, we always talk, did our building become too sterile? You know what I mean? Like, I go into Mike's booth today and I want to paint. You know what I mean? I, re I remember five years ago when we used to walk into Floral Craft, and you would, nothing's more commodity in the craft business than five-inch styrofoam balls, right? And, <laughs> and, and you walk in and you made them into pumpkins and, and snowmen. I'm like, this is unbelievable. So I'm still in awe of the creativity and inspiration that's in the building. Um, how we leverage that is the most difficult thing. You know what I mean? I think if you can connect on that way and to the independents, rock and roll. That's what I think you should be doing. That's what we used to do. When we had six stores, anything's executable, you know? But now when you have a lot more stores, I can't ask Ryan, can I have, you know, 150 samples of that? And Mike, can you do a pay point class in the, into the stores? So um, I think that's the largest opportunity without getting in the weeds on product is that all the samples and creative inspiration in all your booths is, is inspiring. Um, and how you execute that at store level for us is very difficult and something that we challenge ourselves all the time. So quickly, really quickly, so, so he has too many stores to leverage and ask for that sample. You have one store maybe, two stores, and you've made them a strategic vendor of yours. Yeah, you want that sample to go home with you before the end of the show. You bet you do because you have decided what your store is going to be, who, who you are going to be to these manufacturers. You have become loyal to them. You are important to them. And what he can't take home, you can. I have this question for Bobby. Um, I, I've been fortunate enough to know your predecessor, the previous CEO of um, Notions Marketing, her father. And he would never give me the answer, so I'm going to put you on the spot. How old is Notions Marketing? Oh, I know that answer. <laughs> he thought I was going to ask how old Herb was. You know what? I'll answer them both at the same time. So uh, Herb is 80 and Notions Marketing is 80. Wow. So wow. this is our 81st year. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're third generation. Correct. How is, the, what's, how is the role of the wholesaler distributor different today than it was when you first got involved with the business? Oh, it's very different. Um, so many years ago, a distributor was buying from manufacturers and selling to retailers, and that <laughs> kind of was the description. Um, today, it's very, very different because the amount of information that a distributor has about what is selling and what is not selling is immense. They can help you get in the right items. They can keep you out of the wrong items. Uh, they can reduce the amount of dollars that go into your inventory. They can help you increase your turn. Your biggest asset is your inventory, and you're sometimes a limiting factor of expanding your tribe, right? Whether it's through social media or um, you know other marketing efforts that you're going, is the amount of dollars that you can spend on your inventory. So the ability to increase your turn, decrease your inventory, move faster, move out of things faster, move into things faster, and to do that at a speed that is unlike what has happened in, in the past is, is, quite, 
is quite new and fresh. Um, and, you know, add to that, you know, there is a competitive advantage to being first, right? And everyone who is a retailer has that opportunity. <laughs> and uh, so we, it, it's, it's very, very different. It's, it's a lot faster, but uh, a distributor is um, very much a, a partner now to a retailer, providing just a, a lot of good information. You know, and I want to amplify that. I sense there are a lot of independent retailers in the room. When I was on the supply side of the industry, we constantly, probably every day, had a phone call from a retailer who wanted to buy direct, wanted to buy direct, or at shows, can I place an order? And we would always say, who's your wholesaler, who's your distributor? There are so many advantages, as, as Bobby just outlined, and as Stacy has said, to establishing a relationship with a wholesaler if you're an independent. If your buying power is limited, if you're open to buy is tight, um, if the quantities that you can afford to inventory um, are limited, build a relationship with your wholesaler and work closely with them and be loyal to them. And you know, a nickel doesn't mean loyalty. I've seen so many situations where a retailer would jump from wholesaler one to distributor two over a tiny price difference and give up that long, loyal relationship that they had. Um, I'd, I'd really like to put that plug in. There aren't many of them left. When I got in the industry, my first show was 1986, there were probably about 10 big wholesalers across the country. Now that number is not nearly that big today, but the wholesalers themselves are every bit as good and better. They brought the technology, they've got the commitment, they've been in the business for 80 years. They're going to be around. So stick with them, they're good to you. Um, that pretty much satisfies all of our questions tonight. Um, I do want to take a moment to thank our sponsor. SGS was good enough to step up and, and uh, make this event possible for us tonight. I especially want to thank our panel. You've got a tremendous amount of, like, peeking under the kimono here. This is the kind of information that doesn't get shared on the show floor. Um, and these people were open and honest. Um, and I think imparted a lot of information. Again, if there are a lot, I sense a lot of independence. One of the things that stuck out with me was this, the amount of digital content and analytics that are available. And if, you don't, if you're not following that path or that dialogue, when you see these folks on the show floor, or when you're working with your wholesaler, or some of your manufacturers that have a good social media presence, you want to know how there is so much good information about your store, and your customer out there that's pretty much free to grab, make sure you're getting all of it. Doesn't take a lot of time, doesn't take a lot of money. It's a tool that would be very valuable to. So I want to thank this group in particular. I'd like a big round of applause for them. And I want to thank all of you. This is an industry and an association that's, you know, we're in challenging times in some ways, and you've got a very dedicated organization at AFCI that's doing everything they can to keep this industry growing and young, and they've got a lot of new ideas that we're going to be moving forward with in the future. So thank you for supporting your trade association, AFCI. Thanks for coming to Creativation this year, and thanks for coming tonight. Have a good evening.